Do you think that he, there's any validity to the argument that this is more complicated than it seems on the surface and that we can't, we don't have quite the comprehensive understanding that people are claiming that we do and that the models are more complicated than we think? It's more difficult to measure these things than we think. It is difficult to measure these things. However, when the scientific world um, runs their uh, tests and they collect the data and then they interpret the data independently from each other and when the scientific world agrees in an overwhelming percentage what on... What is the scientific world? The scientific in institutions that have tracked climate data independent from each other. Okay, and who governs those institutions and what motivates them? What do you mean what motivates them? What? Okay, who controls the institutions? Depends. Okay, so which institutions are you talking about? Uh, we can put the list on the screen. Okay, so you don't know. Oh, I do. I could. Yeah. Do you want me to read them to you? Well, is there validity in, in what he's saying? Is that I think this is more complicated, and I'm questioning it. And your claim seems to be, we have in, we have uncounterable evidence that these studies are accurate. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So you claim the studies are completely accurate? The studies are accurate because they follow the scientific approach. Right? And the studies focus on a, a time frame. Um, so what are they focusing on? They are focusing on climate change mm -hmm. being a direct consequence of human... Okay. The, the time frame. How can we understand the weather and how in the climate change that was occurring over a hundred years ago when they did not have the technology we have today? How are we able to measure that? I did not look into the specifics of how they measured it. Okay. We have no idea what the impact is from. We don't know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the oceans. We have terrible temperature records going back a hundred years. Almost all the terrestrial temperature, uh, 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 Detection sites were first put outside urban areas, and then as and you're, right, and then you have to correct. Then you have to correct for the for the movement of the urban areas, and then you introduce an error parameter that's larger than the purported increase in temperature that you're planning to measure. This isn't data. This is guess. Because it seems to me that London, for example, in the 1800s, is, was far worse than it is today in terms of climate. It was known that the London fog. It was not natural fog. That was soot in the air, and it was, it was emissions, human-created emissions, which is, has been decreased today. Right, that is, a, that is a particular case in London. Okay. If you want to make that case, this is on a global... Okay, so on a global scale, so I just looked up, as far as air, if you just Google IQ Air, we'll use that as a source, actually looking at... So the countries that ranked the highest, first is Chad, Iraq, Pakistan, Bahrain, India, Egypt, Rwanda, Ghana, Ghana, China, going all the way down, and USA is ranked 102. If you're starting at one as the worst, all the way down, 102. Canada is 93, Sweden, 124. So Sweden has more pollution than the USA. So it seems like we're doing better today than we have at any point in history. Would that be accurate? Because also there's recent studies that less people are driving today than at any point in history. 16 year olds, less 16 year olds are choosing to even get their driver's license than at any point in history. Now there's multiple reasons for that, but if there's less people driving, we have better technology than ever before. There's more conscientious around, conscientiousness around this than ever before it would seem logical to say that we are doing better than at any point in history, yet the alarmism is at a higher rate than any, at any time in history. That's what the data shows. It's not only about pollution. Okay, so what else is it about? The emission of uh, greenhouse gases, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, these have risen, not exponentially, but at a very alarming rate. Alarming, okay, alarming rate. So, the, so it seems that he's, in this debate, he's trying to point out the alarming aspect of it, and that something when something is alarming, it can be wielded as a strategy. We saw this with COVID as well. Alarmism, and using that alarmism combined with government 
becomes problematic. And we see that throughout this debate. Okay, uh, so when he wasn't, if you were playing the clip again, can you deny the data? Can, can you deny the data? Yeah. Well, you'd have to show me the specific data that you're talking about. That's, yeah. And the problem is that these conversations tend to take place in a very generalized manner. So let's just say... Yeah, but you can say the then, data is guess. Okay, then let's say, because here's what... We can agree that if the environment, I care about the environment, if the, it's very important to me, so if the environment is being decimated, I would want to solve that, just like you. Is it possible that we could disagree, though, on how to go about that? That seems to be more where the disagreement is. So let's set, put that aside and discuss how to actually go about that. My argument would be the solution is not more government control or government intervention in, the, in this. So what would be... The alternative, private sector? Private innovation. For example, Elon Musk, what he's, I think people like Elon Musk, and you could say, well, he's one of a kind, though. P the free market will lead to innovations that will have a greater effect. Advent of electric cars, new technology, increased awareness, new education platforms around this. That is only made possible when the government steps away, deregulates these things rather than imposing government sanctions, which goes back to another point he's trying to make that the very act of trying to combat this on a governmental level is going to have impacts on people that we might not be considering. Lower income, people that rely on energy in a different way. And, and the very pursuit, alarmism combined with government, the pursuit of that can have massive ramifications unintentionally that people often overlook. And as far as I can see that he's trying to point that out here. And that's why I do think he comes across much stronger than destiny in this debate. Once you conjure up a climate apocalypse and you make the case that there's an impending disaster that's delayed, and you might say, well, delayed how long? And the response would be, well, we're not sure, but it's likely to occur in the next hundred or so years, which is pretty inaccurate. You now have a universal get out of jail card that can be utilized extremely well by power mad psychopaths. Wouldn't you say that government involvement in a global climate crisis, let's say, okay, that is supported by scientific data? Okay, then I'm going to, the first How thing would I have you, to question where is would the you, crisis aspect of that. Is this a crisis, truly? I mean, if the data supports it, and if we're seeing a rise in CO2 level, and if we're seeing a yeah. rise in global temperatures, like we do, I mean... Okay, but, but then I, you listen to other researchers, Richard Lindzen, Judith Curry, discussing with him, and they're, they are making, they're conducting studies themselves that seem to counter the idea that this is a crisis on the level that is being portrayed. Not that it's not happening, but that it, it is at a level of crisis which validates extreme action. And I think that is questionable. Define extreme action. Ex government, okay, COVID response. That was an extreme action. No, about climate. Climate, the government imposing regulations out of, necess out of necessity caused by a, cr a, a crisis. That if we don't take action, the world will have drastic ramifications in the next 10 years. We have all heard AOC talk about this and other people talking about this, the world, the, framing it as though the world, we are on the precipice. Greta Thunberg, now people are going around gluing their hands to paintings, destroying fine art, holding up traffic, imposing what they think upon other people. And it's the imposition and the pursuit of a crisis that is muddling the waters and I think is actually causing more harm in that pursuit because then people question it even more and and just they get frustrated more and it actually does more harm to the in pursuit than good. Does that answer? It, it, it answers it somewhat, but recognizing that the climate is changing and it is changing due to human intervention, wouldn't that warrant a, uh, some sort of action? 
from well, humanity. Well, what kind of action? First, I would still challenge you on, you'd have to be able to support that, but let's just say that you're right. Okay. The data is overwhelming. Okay, so let's say, okay, so then what kind of action? And I still think that you will, you cannot, if people cannot be enticed, if that's not, if the evidence is not presented in a way that actually entices the innovators in the private sector, public individuals, so I, to actually try and tackle this out of that necessity, it cannot be imposed from a governmental point of view. Which is what Greta Thunberg is calling for at the UN. And that's what we see Elizabeth Warren and politicians who are saying she's right. They, there's concern and I can't blame the people that do notice that pattern saying that they are trying to, there's concern around them wielding this. Because when you combine that with government action, the wielding is the aspect of what can be achieved in the pursuit of a crisis, which goes directly to COVID. And it might be interesting to examine that more, that portion of the debate. Isn't the, the uh, private enterprises, if you were putting this into their hands, with no government involvement, Who's putting it into their hands? No, this is your, what okay. you're saying that the private sector, the likes of Elon Musk and et cetera, if they would actively investigate this and trying to come up with solutions, wouldn't that be a rather slow process? As opposed to what? As opposed to governments doing what intervene and okay when you say that, intervene that's support interesting. that with funds that's and interesting what you just said so if left to their own devices innovators you're saying will not be able to take action and i don't think that's correct would not be no, able to take action able. fast enough so now what you're proposing in that is that government actually has to come in and accelerate that process but how would they do so the only way for them to accelerate that is through force through mandates government passing of new regulations to artificially impose it upon the process to accelerate the very process itself. That's baked into the statement that you just made. Accelerate means maybe give a company a grant, uh, money to... From the government. Which company? I'm sure there can be a panel that... See, the problem... And this is the... What, I mean, I, what innovation would make the most impact on climate? I'm coming at this from the Milton Friedman perspective. The government is not good at handling these things. Just no one is better at conducting, no one's gonna handle your money better than you. No one's going to pursue your interests better than you. And so if your interests align with a problem and that problem is real and not artificially imposed in any way, the outcome will be better than government giving money, where does that money come from? It comes from us, taxes or printing more money, which leads to inflation, which just drives up gas prices and then has more ramifications upon the environment. Where? Because just going back, it doesn't make sense to me though, this model though, because how do you contend with the fact that there's less 16 year olds driving than ever before? We have better technology than ever before. You just saw the ranking of the countries. It's, I mean, so if you really want to change climate change, Russia is putting out way more. China's putting out way more. Why, why is the government treating the crisis in America as though it's, it is, it, it is, seems to be portrayed as though America is unproportionately contributing to this problem, and the data doesn't support that. I don't think that's the case. I think when I say governments, I'm talking worldwide. So how do we do that? What are you going to do? Have, how, how would we... Because this is the more interesting question, though, and I, how do I mean, we get China... These are decisions China? that can be made in, in international organisms, like, I don't the UN, right? Like, it's... So you see why the conundrum comes from, like where if you do, it's because so difficult. This is a difficult. global problem. I don't think anybody says America is to blame for climate change. Right. I, I don't think that's a valid. I also don't think, to Destiny's point, we can just cover our eyes and hope for the best. 
I think that would be a very... Agreed. That's not a wise way to live in the world. I don't think anyone's proposing no. that. And I think when, P when Jordan Peterson asks questions about these studies and he says, I, I don't think this is more complicated, I think that's the very opposite of covering one's eyes. I think that's an unfair characterization on Destiny's part. So, but that's interesting. So you get my point. Maybe we should, because that does correlate to the whole COVID conversation. Do you want to look at that portion of the debate? Yeah. Uh, I don't think you can compare like Hitler to people that are worried about climate change. The worry that I Why have here not? is- So that's interesting. You pulled these clips because you specifically found these clips interesting. <laughs> this one I found a little funny. Well, I so when he's talking about the underlying motivations there and that which connects back to the combination of government control with alarmism, connecting it. So in Germany, for example, they, they were coming off the backs of World War I. They had a declining birth rate. They were impoverished. They were paying reparations from the First World War. They were, they were looking for a solution. They were facing a crisis, and government presented a solution to a crisis. So could you, could you not say that there's a pattern there? Correct. Okay. okay. There might be a pattern there. I, I pulled that clip because I don't think anybody could... Uh, question Hitler's policies or ideas. But you don't, no one can question Hitler's underlying motives? Underlying, I mean, it's pretty clear, right? I think it's, I don't think, saying, no, it's not clear, no. So what would you say Hitler's underlying motives were? I don't know. I don't know, and it's a very complicated. He was, he was obviously motivated to hate Jewish people, and, he, and I think it was the combination of being in an economic terrible situation, anger building up, and when you can provide people a crisis, you can get them to, a rally, to rally around it and do things they would not otherwise do. What were his private intentions? No one can tell, which is why it's a valid question to ask. Can you equate that to climate change? I just did a moment ago where I just said, I'm not saying it's on the same level, but I'm saying the co combination of when a crisis, presenting a crisis to the people on a governmental level and then rallying around that crisis to implement things they would not otherwise do. Do you think that we get effective drugs from pharmaceutical companies? Not particularly. Okay. Do you think that the pharmaceutical companies are reliable? Yes. Okay, we just had a record lawsuit against Johnson & Johnson for their role in the opiate crisis. We just saw what happened with COVID, and that's what this conversation is on the backs of. So a few years ago, the left was very critical of corporations. And now I think what he's identifying here is that there's this switch. Now you seem to have no issue and you seem to trust the pharmaceutical companies because it fits within a conversation. It fits within your perspective now that you're trying to argue. When I don't think prior I'd to all of this, my perspective due okay. to COVID. Okay, then what, what did you change implying. your perspective? Why do you why do you think pharmaceutical companies are trustworthy? I think they make effective drugs, and I think they the medicine helps people. Wouldn't so, you? Yeah, they made very effective opiates, Johnson Johnson. So, but if that's a, how could you say they're not trustworthy when we just had a, a record case lawsuit against one of the largest pharmaceutical companies, the, as well as CVS Pharmacy and other pharmacies like it? Yes. What, what was the case? Their role in, in the opiate crisis. They I, were pushing opiates okay. to make money. Yes. So that, that's, that's saying that pharmaceutic, pharmaceutical companies are not making effective drugs? I don't... Their motivations, he's, he's, he's drawing questions about their underlying motivations. You can make the mistake of approving a drug that turns out to have very harmful side effects. That's one mistake. That will harm the public. Or you can make the mistake of not approving a drug which would have very beneficial effects. Your self-interest lies in taking all kinds of chances of failing to approve a good drug in order to reduce the chance that you will approve a bad drug. Bureaucrats who survive will only be able to survive 
if they follow a policy that is very harmful to the consumer. Can you agree I with the Milton I Friedman don't disagree with the fact that they might be corrupt on some level, or they, that they are corrupt, and the, that at the end of the day they're a business. Do you think government... But can you put in the balance the, let's say, harm with the good? If you're asking me, do I think we need pharmaceuticals? Yes. Yeah, we do, right? But how do we go about getting those pharmaceuticals to be the best that they can, the most effective they can be? And I, going back to Milton Friedman, I think it's not through government. It's not through the FDA. The results are that you will have an excess of prevention of good drugs in order to avoid excess of prohibition of good drugs in order to avoid admitting a few bad ones that you will increase the costs of doing medical research, that you will reduce the amount of medical research done, that you will reduce the battery of drugs available to the public. So if I'm, a pharmace if I'm trying to create a pharmaceutical product, it's designed for the, a market, I'm going to want to include as much information that will make it easiest for the marketplace to purchase that product. So it would be in my best interest making that product to be transparent not the government's. It's actually coming from my desire to sell the product and to do so in a transparent way because the consumer is going to appreciate transparency more so than the government. So when the government acts and requires transparency, it's coming from a different place of motivation. What is that motivation? The motivation to make, to make a product that best appeals to the consumer. And in doing so, I need to be transparent. So what is the government's motivation? Well, that's a good question. It has become much more expensive to meet FDA standards since the 1962 Kefauver Amendments, which greatly strengthened the requirements imposed on the FDA, requiring them to judge not only the safety, but also the efficacy. Come on, like there's entire campuses of startup pharmaceutical companies with quite interesting... Uh, uh... Sure, and government regulation makes that more difficult to do, though. But around They're still COVID, subjected to trials, to okay. phases of trials, right? And I think that's a good thing. Yeah. And the question around the COVID conversation would probably be around whether those trials were actually adhered to in the way that they were claiming. No, like I don't think hasn't? so. No, I don't think that you're so. You're just wrong. I think they're you're completely wrong. I see. So you don't think that the pharmaceutical companies who dominate the advertising landscape with 75% of the funding are corrupt? You can't deny the number of people that got infected, the number of people that died from this virus. I think the, most people lost their, um, or a lot of people lost their um, trust in scientists because of the way the, the events unfolded. So it was like, masks don't work. Oh, wear masks. Uh, but in a volatile, in, in a right, with a, a new disease where you don't have the data, where the data is coming in, maybe the discourse should have been at this particular point in time, based on the data that we have, we are making this uh, claim about that. We are awaiting more data to update the public. I think that would have been a better way to phrase it. Going exactly. back to our conversation Which is about what I language, think we should right? be doing about climate change. I would apply that exact statement you just made and apply that to the very beginning of this conversation around the climate conversation. That's the argument that's being made, is that that's the position we should be taking on climate change. Because it's the combination of a crisis with government implementation into that crisis the time doing things they would not otherwise do. But there the is much more. Is the same. There is much more data in the climate conversation than the, that, okay. that that it was at the time when these conversations were taking place about. But government. we see, for example, the mistakes that can be made when we act out of alarm in the to tackle a crisis. So you, it's not a surprise that people are questioning that crisis in the wake of the COVID crisis and the and what we saw actually occur. And it's interesting that the two do naturally tie together. Yeah, I'm talking about the way the information was presented. I would say the same. Not, not the validity of whether or not it was a pandemic or the validity of the vaccine, just the way in which the scientific world 
presented that. Or not the scientific world, I guess. Um, what's his name? Dr. Fauci. Right? Yeah, which I think that it, the, the word, I mean, this phrase, the scientific world, it does give a new context to it after seeing how it was wielded in that way. I don't it was given it was... a face. Action figures were made. It's the science. It became... So I don't blame people for asking questions now. We have to conduct ourselves carefully. Otherwise, whenever something does come along, it's like the boy who cried wolf. When something does come along, it's going to be natural that people are going to question it in the wake of this. I'm not contesting the data. I'm just saying that... Well, maybe you should. On what? The efficacy of these, of the Pfizer, of the, the efficacy of what they were claiming. I mean, just with your own eyes. How many people have you seen get COVID after how many boosters? It seems, I've seen, I mean, my mom, after getting every booster that's ever existed, seemed to be getting it even more. She's gotten it like three times, two or three times. And the symptoms got worse. Okay. I've gotten it once. <laughs> Did you have the booster at that point? No, I had the vaccine. So you had the vaccine, no booster? No. Have you ever gotten a booster? Yes. That was after getting it? Yeah. Interesting. Well, cool. That was a good conversation. Should we look at any more of this? Yeah, we can. It's a little risky. But, but yet we've been on this vaccine schedule for how many decades? Like and this. Of like this. Not like this. Not He's, carefully. I mean, it's... I had a ton of vaccines when I was a child. It connects exactly with what we were talking about. There's way more now. Okay. 